Good morning. I should say howdy. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to share some of my research here with TechStart colleagues. And today uh, I'll talk about our research in looking at the future outlook of flood peaks over the San Antonio River Basin. However, this approach, as I explained to you, you'll find out it's applicable to most, you know, mixed urban and non-urban uh, watersheds, and uh, examples can be related to like the recent Harvey flood. Okay, so uh, Texas is very large, everything's big, and including the climate uh, gradients. And as you can see that here, with precipitation, when I first got here, I was told that you drive from West Texas to East Texas, 800 miles, every mile you drive, you have a millimeter precipitation more. So you drive from arid regions to very humid regions. Similarly, very large temperature gradients, and you all know that two days ago we are 90 degrees, and now <laughs> you know, we have to wear a sweater. So with these uh, you know, large gradients, what happens is that uh, we have drought in the floods very frequently. Uh, five years ago, when I first came here, everybody was talking about 2011 drought, and nowadays we are talking about the hurricane floods. And actually, since two, day, uh, two years ago, we have the Memorial Day floods, such and such. So uh, this is uh, particularly related to the unique climate and you know, um, uh, watershed conditions in Texas. Most watersheds, those large river basins go from uh, west to east, from the north to south. So these cut through those uh, gradients I just showed earlier. <coughs> and then what we are looking at here is the annual maximum stream flow anomaly against the average flow so that we are looking at the percentage. Over these 10 largest river basins in Texas, and uh, this San Antonio River Basin has the largest variations. And in fact, San Antonio has a lot of you know, flooding uh, situations, primarily because this is not like uh, uh, Trinity Brazos or Colorado River Basin, you have some arid region. And here the variation can cause much changes with the stream flow. So, Another phenomenon with uh, Texas is the growing of population, urbanization. This has two parts of impact. First of all, we have you know, these four largest cities count like uh, top, uh, they all belong to like top 11 most populated uh, cities in the US. And on one hand, with the population growth, it exacerbates the flood, con the drought conditions because the water demand increases. At the same time, uh, it also affects the hydrological processes, primarily because of change of the land cover. With the, here, what you are looking at are the land cover uh, types from the satellite image classification, the pink and red area, the urban, semi-urban area, and you see the, uh, the fast growth of these major cities in Texas. And these urban area, they are impervious. As a result, you know, they change the hydrological processes. And you have much less infiltration, but you generate a lot more surface runoff. In terms of flood, you see an earlier flood peak and larger flood peak. And this is what we study here, okay? As I said, we're interested in the San Antonio River Basin, which, it, uh, which consists of six um, subwater basins. And San Antonio is prone to flood, and the population grows really fast. I'll show uh, uh, soon how this population growth is related to the urban land cover change. And so the questions I intend to answer in this uh, presentation is that when we have urbanization and also this climate variability, and which factor you know, contribute to the future flood peaks more? And of course, these two factors, they happen simultaneously. 
and what's the combined effect looking into the future. And how, how about uncertainties? We don't know how the population would be growing in the next you know, 20, 40, 50 years. And we really don't, even worse, we really don't know how the climate variation would be in the future. So we want to understand uh, the uh, situations uh, in terms of uncertainties. The modeling tool I use is called a distributed hydrology soil vegetation model. Uh, it's a fully distributed model, meaning that we look at, you know, we do simulations over each grid cell instead of like sub watershed. And the resolution, the grid cell resolution, we can tune it from like 10 meters as high to 200 meters. In this example here, we are showing the results in terms of 200 meter simulations. Also, we can simulate from uh, sub daily, like hourly to daily time steps. And uh, the advantage of this distributed model is that I can uh, set, you know, prioritize which area is urban. This differs from like if you have lump model, in which case, you know, you look like sub watershed. You know that the developers, they are not going to say, we are going to build a Walmart just because uh, we want to make sure within such watershed. They build differently, so this model has the advantage. And another thing I don't have time to explain today is that we also added the reservoir module to this hydrologic model so that we can simulate the interactions. So here, just a uh, schematic about the pr uh, hydrologic processes it involves basically it's a run uh, rainfall runoff model. You have the precipitation and then there's a surface runoff and then there's the infiltration and then we have the channel flow and with the routing we use a linear reservoir routing and our routing is Wendy uh, model. And to represent the future climate, you know, a lot of debate is that how, to what degree we can trust those future, you know, uh, climate model output. In this case, we uh, we choose to look at the overall trend, and what you are looking at, uh, these four panels shows from different uh, model covered uh, scenarios, and the solid line here is historical stream flow climatology, and in San Antonio River Basin, there are two peaks, uh, one in the late spring, the other in the fall season. And these are the stream flows based on uh, historical data. Those bars, what you are looking at is we look at the future period, like uh, the f first part of this century and the later part of the century from different models. And in the middle is a mean, like we are looking at 12 different uh, climate models. We take the mean. Uh, the medium value here, and then we have the maximum minimum. Maximum minimum represents the uncertainty coming from the models, and you know uh, this medium shows like most likely what's going to happen. We use a change factor function, meaning that we look at the climatology, and they say, okay, in the future this month, uh, the precipitation would be like 90 percent of uh, in the past. Because one thing for sure, climate models are not going to predict the future flood. Okay, so we just want to have the bow chart, uh, ballpark about what's going to happen, and we assume in the future the precipitation patterns will stay the same, but the magnitude will change. And with urbanization, uh, these four are from the land cover maps uh, processed from uh, the satellite Landsat. And these are like based on the, you see that population and the urban impervious area historically, we found a nonlinear relationship. So we can predict if this population grows at 50% uh, of the 2010 rate, then the future urban area would be such and such. And then we use GIS, we found the urban area. And so we have three uh, sets of scenarios, there's no population growth, like no people moving into Texas, but because of aging, you still see, you know, the increased urban area, 50% and uh, 100 uh, and 100%. Oh, I'm sorry, this is 0%, this is 100%. And 
near future and far future. So these are the input. For hydrologic models, one thing very important is to calibrate and validate its model first, because otherwise we call it garbage in, garbage out, we can't get things right. So, so we calibrated the model over each of these watersheds, and then we validated the results uh, at the river basins outlet. And we are looking at the daily statistics. So now we have confidence that the model can reproduce historical stream flows, but our goal is not to reproduce USGS measurement. Our goal is to use the model to help us understand how change of land cover and future climate variability will uh, affect the peak flows. And then this is what do we have. When we look at the urbanization, uh, if you recall, we have all those land cover maps. Uh, we run the model with the same type of uh, climate forcings over five years, uh, but we keep changing the land cover. Uh, therefore, we see that you know, this is the medium annual maximum stream flow, right? So for instance, when we look at the uh, hurricane flood, we are looking at this is 100, 500 uh, year flood. We are looking at the annual me uh, maximum stream flow, but we are looking at the extremes. Now what I'm showing is that when you have this series of maximum flows, you look at the medium value, which is more representative for, towards the climatology. So here is what happens. Uh, with the increasing urban cover, you see that around 2000 in the late 90s, that there's this uh, jump with the peak stream flow. And in the future, we look at those three scenarios with different population growth rate, and we have a range. This is what's going to expect given the same type of current climate, but with the change of land cover. And then we look at the future climate. We uh, basically, we multiply the factors to the historical uh, forcings. And we use, in this case, we use one fixed land cover so that we can just focus on the role of the climate variations. And we look at two things. One is that we compare these different climate scenarios. And you can see that actually the medium values pretty much stays the same with the solid line is what's uh, happened historically. And if we look at the seasonal variations, this is also historical, and the median, you know, you see a little bit change in the spring. Seems like the value is going down a little bit. In the uh, fall season, it goes up a little bit. But pretty much you don't see too much differences in terms of the median values, although there's a large variation, right? So now we are going to combine these two together meaning that when I change land cover, I also change into like the future uh, precipitation projections. And this time, you see that the peak flows start to jump high. And what caused this is primarily of the increased urban land cover. And if we look at the seasonal variation, now this fourth season, if you recall in the previous slide, that here, this precipitation change a little bit, but when you have the future climate and the urbanization coupled together, you really see the difference, right? And with large variations. So therefore, we are going to look at the uncertainty in this part. And this uncertainty, we are looking at, this is a little bit hard to read, this figure. So we start from the history, which is there is a given uh, stream flow. And if we look at drive the model using the medium of all those ensembles, you know, I just change the land cover. And so this is zero population growth, 50% and 100%. Then we'll see like around the mid 21st century and late 21st century, these shows the impact solely from the urban land cover chain. If we overlay this 
thinking about, if you recall, there's a min minimum uh, precipitation from those 12 ensemble uh, members, and there's a maximum number value, then you see this large variation. So from here to here, given the same 50% of population increase, but here shows the possibility of the climate variation. We don't know whether this is going to happen or not, but this is a, roughly, this is a range you need to work out. And when you have these two together, you see, in general, when you combine this, uh, this number gets, this uncertainty range start to get really large. So this is pretty much what we found from uh, this study. And in short, that in the San Antonio River Basin area, that the urbanization has increased uh, significantly over the last uh, decades and is going to continue increase. By uh, 2050, the city would have about 2 million people. And then if we look at the future climate variability alone, if we just focus on the medium value, we really don't see much of the change of the peak flows. However, uh, if we have these two joined together, urbanization will be able to amplify the magnitude of this variation significantly. And there's large uncertainties. Uh, when we talk about uncertainties, which one is more uncertain in my opinion? Uh, the climate part variability is more uncertain because with the population growth, there's a range, but it's easier, relatively easier. We have more confidence to predict, to look into the future. So this work, if you're interested, uh, it's already published in a journal last year. Feel free to contact me or go to my website. We have that. And then uh, it's primarily carried out by my PhD student, uh, Eric Zhao, I need to give most credit to him and my collaborator. This is founded by NSF. And also, I just want to go back to what I said at the very beginning. This is a fairly general approach that you can apply to most you know, watersheds. And also, with the reservoir model we added in it, we, uh, we think we have some capability to look at into like the uh, reservoir operations as well. OK? Thank you very much. <laughs>